Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this evening's webinar. I hope you can all hear us. Um, do, do shout out to say that you can, if you, if you have the ability to do that. Um, this, I think, would be a conversation very much worth having at any point in time. Um, I think it's all the more worth having, given what so many families and so many people um, individually and collectively are experiencing because of COVID. Um, the art of dying well, let me just place a few of the names and place names that you're going to hear in the next hour into context. The art of dying well um, at St. Mary's University in Twickenham is a center for public engagement, policy and research around death and bereavement. Um, and I, I think it's, it's time has well and truly come actually. Um, it should have come anyway, but I think COVID and what we've been experiencing in a very public and very shared way has made it all the more urgent. So let me introduce the panel of speakers to you straight away. And just so you know the, the shape of the event, um, there'll be about 20 minutes of the panelists speaking, sharing their thoughts on the things they wish to emphasize. Then I will ask a few of the questions that you have all very kindly uh, already sent in, or many of you have already sent in, um, and then after that, after about 10 or 15 minutes of that, we'll have time for some more uh, live questions in light of what you have heard as well. So a combination of uh, preconceived questions and questions in light of what you're about to hear. So let me just introduce our guests, our panelists to you tonight. Um, first, doc Dr. Catherine Mannix, palliative care physician and author of With the End in Mind. Baroness Elora Finlay, a Welsh doctor, professor of palliative care medicine uh, and an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords and a member of the APHG. Uh, Dr Lynn Bassett, retired healthcare chaplain in acute and palliative settings as well. Welcome to you all. And Ghazala Makada, Makda, sorry, apologies Ghazala, Ghazala Makda, end of life doula, care and occupational therapy expert witness our hosts tonight, as I said at the beginning, of the Centre for the Art of Dying Well at St. Mary's University. So each of our guests is going to speak for about five minutes. Uh, so why don't I do it in the order that I read it for no reason other than it's simple and start with Dr. Catherine Mannix. Thank you. I'm going, I'm going to uh, start the conversation by talking to you about ordinary dying, because that is, in fact, what we're talking about here. We're talking about how do we offer companionship to people at the very end of their lives. And the thing about dying is we've forgotten about it. So a hundred years ago, we wouldn't have needed to gather in the town square because there were no webinars to talk about and educate ourselves about dying. We would all have seen it many, many times and we would have been familiar with the sequence of events that happens as a person's body winds down towards their death. Wonderful medical developments over the 20th century completely changed that. There became possible that we could make rapid responses to people who were very, very sick. And in doing that, we could not only reverse their dying, but we could restore them to full health. And that was a fantastic thing and a cause for celebration. And of course, it meant that instead of waiting at home to die, People who were so sick that they might die were transferred very quickly to a hospital where the hospital gave them its all in an attempt to save their lives. The difficulty was, though, that, of course, not everybody could survive and death became seen as a medical failure. And so death became a slightly embarrassing thing that we were no longer familiar with. We didn't understand the process and we also started to give away the language. And when you listen even to the BBC, you will hear about people who have passed or been lost rather than who have died. And so instead of having an understanding of this process in the same way as we understand the process, for example, of giving birth, we simply have fear and dread. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about what that process of dying actually looks like. The thing that's interesting is that whatever illness or condition it is that brings us to the end of our lives, unless it's something that happens suddenly and catastrophically, which is increasingly rare with, uh, with modern medicine, what generally happens is that people become more tired. They're weary, they sleep more, they're awake for periods of time, and then they need to recharge themselves. A bit like when you've got a mobile phone with a battery that just isn't doing it anymore and you need to recharge it more and more often. Sleep is the recharge that allows us to be able to waken for a time, do something that's important to us, 
and then go back for another recharge with sleeping. As time goes by, what we find is that those periods of being asleep get longer and being awake becomes shorter. And in fact, gradually, instead of it being sleep, it becomes deep unconsciousness. And as the brain shuts down, there's increasing evidence that hearing is likely to be preserved, but the only other bit of the brain that still is working is that bit that drives our breathing. And now it's just automatic breathing. It's cycles that move between fast and slow and between deep and shallow. And as the brain becomes deeply unconscious, we're no longer aware even of that very, very sensitive part of the back of our throat that we're normally so aware of. A crumb hits it or a, a, a drop of tea goes down the wrong way. So now saliva can lie there and not cause us to cough or sputter or swallow. We simply tolerate it. And the breath is coming in and out or perhaps a little pool of saliva as it makes a bubbling, clicking noise. People describe that as the death rattle, as though it's something terrifying, when actually what it tells me is this person is so deeply unconscious that they're not even aware of the back of their throat anymore. Sometimes people don't realise that they're breathing out with their vocal cords a little bit tight, so there'll be a moaning noise as they breathe out. And it's really important that we check that it's not because they're distressed but almost always it's not because they're distressed, it's because they're deeply unconscious and they're breathing through their vocal cords that are a little bit tight. So very important that we explain this to families and they know to expect these cycles of breathing and gradually then the breathing will become slower until eventually there is a breath out that just isn't followed by another breath in. And anybody who is frequently in attendance to people who are dying will have met families where they've been sitting around the bed and come in, the person's clearly stopped breathing in the last few minutes and the family hasn't noticed yet because it's been so gentle. And then the heart finally stops beating just a few minutes after that final breath. So although we've got very hung up on dying, I think what we really need to be thinking about is that living at the very end of life. Because if we plan ahead, that will let us think about what matters most to us. And is that about the place we're in? Or is it about the people who are around us? Or is it about our preferences for who is around and what we talk about and what's on the radio? Is it our preferences for cultural traditions and spiritual care? There are lots of important things for us to think about in that last part of our living because dying isn't a medical event. It's way more important than that. This is the last part of our living. It's a social thing that involves us and the people who are most important to us. And so there are really important conversations to have with our beloveds. And these are the sorts of things that we need to think about. If you could choose to live the last weeks and days of your life anywhere, I am betting that you're probably not going to choose your local district general hospital. So where would you want that to be? And for that to happen, what needs to change where you live to allow people to have that choice? So tonight we want to invite people to reimagine dying so that people are able to choose non-medical settings if that's their wish and to have confident companions around them, non-medical companions, aided and abetted by the nurses and doctors and physios and other clinicians who help to keep the symptoms under good control. But once the symptoms are controlled, people want to get on with living the last part of their lives. So instead of being surrounded by machines and drips, like this lady in our advertisement, she can actually be in the place and with the people who matter most to her. That's all I'm saying for now, because we're moving quickly to get through everything so that we can answer your questions at the end. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, let's move on to Baroness Elora Finlay. Uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine, for, for that. I'm going to also try to share my screen with some slides uh, and hope that this works for everybody. Because I was thinking about dying in today's world. I want to cover off the big question about where are the relatives today? Where have they been during COVID? 
how do we care for someone dying at home in the current situation with COVID? What about dementia and it impairs capacity? And what about best interests? And then why DNR is a dangerous shorthand for DNA CPR? And what relatives can do if there's somebody asks them, do you want your relative resuscitated? And they are bowled over by that question in shock. So where are the relatives? Well, human rights, right to a family life in Article 8, I worry, has been infringed by our over risk averse, perhaps, uh, approach. And we have to balance risks. We have to balance the risk of infection to others, uh, particularly of the relative who may be visiting somebody in a care home or coming to see them at home, the infection risk to staff, and the problem of long-term grief in those bereaved when the relatives, perhaps somebody who'd been married for decades and then isn't with the person they love when they're dying. Huge problems with that. So I question why not let the relatives stay? Think about how they come in and out. So there's minimum exposure, distance aware all the time, uh, but they need food and they need drink. Advise them about washing their clothes, stripping off when they get home, putting things in the washing machine, minimizing contact and viral transfer possibly. But think has the relatives themselves have COVID? A lot of younger people have. It wasn't formally diagnosed with the test, but the symptoms would suggest they did. Is the relative young and fit and so unlikely to get severe COVID rather than someone with a lot of pre-existing conditions? But above all, did they want to take that risk as an informed risk? Does the person who's been married to someone for over 60 years want to sit at the bedside of the person they love as they're dying and take the risk that they might get COVID too. And those are choices which I think we shouldn't deny people. I was worried about caring for people at home and thank you, Catherine, for that introduction to it. And so have written a short guide for families, for relatives. And it, there's sections in it are, first of all, how you take the decision about being at home and dying at home. What's involved in that decision? a bit about things for healthcare professionals, but then very practical tips for people at home. How you manage a dry mouth? What do you do if someone is sick or agitated? What about pee and poo? They can't get to the toilet. You haven't got a commode there. Perhaps you can't lift them. What can you do? Very simple, practical tips and how you manage breathlessness in somebody when you're at home with them and it's frightening. What about when the person isn't responding? What do you do? How do you recognize that they are now dying? All laid out very simply. And what do you do after death when you think they've died? What should you do? In fact, there's nothing to do. Just sit quietly, make a note of the time and draw breath yourself. And then a little bit about helpful ways to tell other people. The guides available on the Bevan Commission website on the slide that link takes you to it um, and I'm a commissioner with the Bevan Commission and it's also available on the Hospice UK website again that link takes you to where it is published there but what about people with dementia or learning difficulties and where you're not sure whether they can take the decision or not and what do you need to do well, remember that capacity is for that decision at that time. It is decision and time specific. And think, can the decision wait until perhaps the person is a bit better? If it can't, consult people who know that person, know their wishes and feelings, know what they might have been. But above all, remember the five principles of the Mental Capacity Act. So presume they have capacity support them in, uh, in making a decision. Remember that they can make unwise decisions. And if they can't make a decision, consult people widely and use the least restrictive option. But remember that your decision is for a specific decision. So somebody might be able to make some decisions
but not others. Think can capacity be restored? The Hug has just won an award this week from Cardiff Metropolitan University. I declare my interest as I chair the Board of Governors. This is, is like a soft toy which has a heartbeat in it and has some sound as well and breathing sounds. And for people with dementia, it helps calm them down. They go from being agitated to being much calmer. And when they're calmer, they can understand more information. They can retain it, they can weigh it up and they can communicate better too. Music is another way of helping people regain a bit of capacity that's been lost. And just in my last moments, why DNAR is just a terrible shorthand and dangerous. What do you mean by resuscitation? It's simply the action of reviving someone from unconsciousness or apparent death. That's all. And that could be anything. That's giving sugar to someone in a diabetic coma. That's giving fluids to somebody who's dehydrated. That's giving IV antibiotics to someone in septic shock. What do you mean by it? Do you mean do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation? For the individual, you must be clear what you will do, what you won't do, and why. People must be involved as much as possible, and those who know the person consulted. And think always, if an intervention won't be of any benefit, only a burden or harmful, then it shouldn't be given. And there comes a time when we all accept natural death. But if somebody is asked, should we resuscitate your relative? What should you as a relative do? Ask, what do you mean by resuscitation? What will you do? What will you not do? and ask if the heart stops unexpectedly, will you attempt CPR? Because that is a clinical decision on the day, but please, can we stop using the phrase DNR or DNAR because it's dangerous, it's too non-specific, and people get denied the care that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's a really important distinction you just made there. Um, Thank you very much indeed, Baroness Laura Finlay. Uh, Dr. Lynn Bassett uh, joins us now, retired healthcare chaplain in acute and palliative uh, settings. Lynn. Good evening. Um, the desire that no one should die alone, I think is really deep in our human makeup. We often think of solitary confinement as a punishment. And when we're in isolation, our fears can grow bigger and we can feel smaller. It's natural, it's no wonder that we want to be with, or we want someone at least to be with our loved ones when they're dying. Having said that, as one participant noted, people often seem to choose to slip away just when we've popped out of the room. So in deathbed accompaniment, I think we're trying to achieve a balance between being there and available so that the dying person doesn't feel abandoned or isolated or afraid, and also giving them the space they need to let go. So traditionally, this role fell to relatives, members of the community, to sit, keep vigil, accompany the dying person. And we know that sometimes relatives and family can overcrowd, and we know that sometimes uh, a single um, loved one can actually need support to stay alongside. But of course, COVID-19 removed all visitors from our hospital sites, almost entirely to begin with, and even now still with restricted visiting. Finding ways to accompany at a distance has challenged our creative responses. So the revised deathbed etiquette, which we revised at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, offers suggestions of ways that people can be with their loved ones, somehow connected, even when they can't be physically with their loved ones. In parallel, we saw hospitals stepping up with facilitating phone and video links and allocating liaison staff so that people at home knew what was going on. Even before COVID-19, there were more and more hospitals beginning to set up schemes um, 
using end of companions. About a third, I think, had these in place. I don't know how many maintained them throughout the pandemic because of course they're volunteers. But to be with people, to fill the gaps, to take the place of somebody who couldn't be there. So what is the role of an end of life companion? Well, I think the motivations and the practice of accompaniment are pretty much the same as ever. It's just that the external circumstances have changed. So if you think of the analogy of music, the accompanist is not the one center stage. That's the place of the soloist in our scenario, the dying person. The accompanist is there alongside. They need to be attuned and in tempo. They need to be not too loud and not too soft. It demands attentiveness, listening, and I think humility. Perhaps for many of us, the biggest challenge is to deny our own desire to do something and instead just to be. Not doing anything can make us feel helpless, vulnerable, uncomfortable. But actually, I believe from my own experience that that's where the closest human connections begin. And it's in that human connection that the dying person finds comfort and peace, I think. One of the questioners tonight asked whose need does actually end of life companionship answer? Is it us? I wasn't sure who us was, but I think it's a fair question. And I think it's something we need to hold in awareness, especially in these times when we do reach out to touch or, you know, uh, is that to make us feel better, to make them feel better? We have to be aware. Okay. But evaluations have shown that end of life companions really are appreciated by patients, by their loved ones, and by staff on the ward, because it's another person there, present. If COVID cases spiral and visitors are once again removed from the bedside, I think competent, well-trained companions are going to have a really important role in helping to support everyone in the circle of care. And I think what um, Catherine said about confident companions, um, not necessarily in healthcare settings. So another questioner asked about training. And of course there's training, there's training in the hospitals, there's training from charities. I just want to mention the training that we're contemplating with the Art of Dying Well and the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. This is a very long established Catholic organization that supports the poor, the isolated, the sick and the dying and bereaved, both in practical ways and in spiritual ways. Now, during lockdown, I've been accompanying some of their members as they embrace the challenges of moving from face-to-face -face meetings to telephone conversations. Undoubtedly, establishing a sense of connection over the phone can be a lot more complicated. But if that's the only human contact that that person has in that day or that week, isn't that worthwhile? So we carry on. The next step is to produce introductory training for those who are interested in end of life companionship, whether in hospital or in the community. So drawing on the expertise of the art of dying well and their resources, um, this session will bring together some practical information about being with the dying, practical information about working in healthcare environments or in the home. Uh, while at the same time exploring the personal qualities that are needed for this very sensitive ministry. The training, of course, will be online and how it pans out in the evolving COVID-19 environment is still a work in progress. I think that we're very much in a time of unknowing. I hope and pray that cases and admissions will not increase, but at least we do have some learning and some experience from what went on earlier in the year. And I'm going to be really interested in hearing more about that as the evening unfolds. So thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lynn Bassett. Let's go straight to uh, Ghazala Makta, end of life doula, care and occupational therapy expert witness as well. Ghazala. Thank you. I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, do let me know when I've done that. 
Are you able to see any slides? Not yet. We can see one another still, but not your slides. Uh, um, now? Yeah, uh, yes, we can see the Art of Dying Well slide. Perfect. There is. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sheila. Okay. I'd like to sh share my experiences as an end of life doula in my local community as well as in my faith community. An end of life doula is a companion who walks alongside the person with a life limiting illness. It's a being role. That is, you're being there for someone. It's a non-professional role in which one does not offer advice or treatment, but provides emotional, spiritual, moral, practical support and guidances for the choices to be made at the end of life. The support is provided at a human level to address the person's need with their values and what they would like. In the work I'm sharing, all names and identity have been changed. I give my immense gratitude to all those who have given me the opportunity to share their walk. Here's a quote from someone I've had the privilege to serve as a doula. David said, I've been suffering from cancer for the last 10 years and I've been so afraid. You've made it easier for me to think and talk about issues so I now feel in control of the process. David's wife, Sue, looked after him in the last few years. He was confined to spending most of his time in his recliner chair. Sue had concerns of her own. She wondered what she'd do if she found he had died in his sleep. She was concerned how anyone will get David out of their home as he's now 22 stones. But the doorways Will the doorways be wide enough? She worried how she would organize a large coffin and, and his funeral. I was able to support David, Sue and their family for the last five months of his life. David went on to do his advanced statement, advanced decision, lasting power of attorney and organized his funeral. He felt at peace and in control of what was to come. And there was an acceptance by Sue and their children I've continued to support Sue after David died. My next example is a lady, we'll call her Sarah. She said, I want this to end soon. I do not want to prolong my life. I need help to say this to my family. Sarah was well supported by her daughter, husband and her church friends. All were saying to her that she was a fighter and not to give up. Sarah had seen her sister go through the same condition and so she did not want to have treatment to prolong her life. She said she was pleased. I walked into her life and talked about her wishes to me. At my next visit, she asked her husband and her daughter to be there and was able to say to them what she really wanted. They were upset but respected her wishes and now knew of her suffering. Sarah went, went on to do her advanced decision in presence of her daughter, who was an ITU nurse and her husband. After this, burden was lift, her burden was lifted. She started writing letters to her near and dear ones, both asking for forgiveness and forgiving. My last example is for a mother of five. Mary was constantly saying, I'm afraid, please don't leave me. Death to some is fearsome and lonely. I've had the opportunity to take time to sit with Mary who was dying to hold space. I sat holding her hand and asked her, what was she afraid of? And she said she didn't know. She's of Catholic faith, so I sat praying for her. She was listening, her eyes closed, gripping my hand tightly. Every time I moved to get, moved to get comfortable, she would say, don't leave me. I invite, I invited her to hold the hand of Jesus as well as mine. And when I was leaving her, I told her Jesus will be holding her hand. When I inquired the following day, I was told she'd calmed down and she died peacefully. Before COVID-19, a fellow doula and I ran a death cafe once a month, providing opportunities for all mortals to drop in and talk about death and dying. Next, I'd like to share my recent experience of working within my own faith community, which is a Daudi Bora Shia Muslim community. 
During COVID-19, we're all living in the age of Zoom and virtual world these days. Death has become somehow more real and familiar to most of us. In the last few months, too often our community has recited a prayer when someone dies called Sadakallah via Zoom, as funeral attendants have been severely restricted. One of our Zoom topics in May this year during the month of Ramadan was death and dying. When we came together, stories poured out of loss, grief, guilt, sadness, heavy burden on people's heart, not having support to deal with this or know how to prepare for death of their loved ones. I was able to hold space with people during that session and they were able to benefit from my doula skills. Evidence shows that those people who have planned in advance for their end of life have greater quality of life when they reach their final days. In addition, those surviving experience less stress, anxiety and depression. I set about with a few members of our community to start a series of advanced planning for end of life. We've held five sessions in these series and you can see these have been our topic. We've been asked the question, where next? So for our community, we are due to start a carer support group as those people who are caring for their loved ones in these times are finding it incredibly hard, feeling lonely and wanting support. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ghazala, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, some questions have been coming in while you've been speaking and I'll get to those momentarily, but a, a, let's go through a handful and not that many to be honest, just because of time constraints. I, I, you've covered in, in, in everything each of you has said, you've, you've answered many of the questions that came through actually before the event itself. So I, I'd prefer to give more time to those live questions coming in in light of what you've said. But one struck me and I, I, I'll, I'll put it to um, Dr. Lynn Bassett, but if the others feel an urgent need to say something, please do as well. Um, it's from Paul, uh, who is a, a member of a prison chaplaincy team. Um, and he, he, because it's a team and the same person isn't always there, he wants to ask about consistency. How do you uh, maintain and ensure consistency for what that person's need or needs are? A difficult one. Okay. I think, there is, I think there's a value in a team in that one person can't possibly be there 24-7. So in a sense, if your if you're patient uh, and people around them uh, need support, if, they, if they're linked into a team, then, then there's more chance that they're going to connect with whoever turns up. So I think there's advantages there. I understand that probably one will be enjoyed more than another, maybe by different individuals. Um, consistency is about handover, isn't it? And, 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 and notes and just keeping each other in tune to what's going on. But um, I think we just have to be grateful. <laughs> we have to be grateful for the team that's there and there's as many as Other there people. are. <laughs> yeah. um, and, 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 and do your best to, um, to, 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 to keep each other in touch so you don't make those stupid blunders of, of, of asking the same questions twice, but, um, and, but then, then being there for them. And uh, quite a few questions um, touched on this, this, this notion of making sure that if you are accompanying someone, you are doing it for them in a way that serves them, not in a way that serves you. Now, I had a momentary experience of this in a longer period of accompanying someone. It was my auntie, who I was very close to, um, but she wasn't, she wasn't a sort of showy, tactile kind of woman, you know. And when I first sat by her bed, knowing that at some point in the next day and a half, we would lose her, I held her hand and um, she pulled it away. You know, and I, I remember thinking, oh, she doesn't want me here. Oh, oh, but it was it was a perfect example of that kind of thing. She, she did want me there and she did speak to me a couple of times beyond that. But she was she needed she needed her space to prepare for what was coming. She was fine without that. And I got that message. I mean, it was a it was a stark one when it came. But I think it's an important one in, in case in case you don't get it from them. The message, as I did, Um any thoughts, perhaps Catherine Mannix on this, any, any thoughts on what you might say to somebody if they're still able to communicate with you about what they need? 
think that's a great example that you've just given us. And I think it's really important that picking up that point about who who are we helping here, that actually if we've been able to have a previous conversation with people about what they would like, they still, of course, are living and able to change their minds. And we do meet people who actually think they want to be surrounded by their families and then find that actually they need the quiet inner focus that allows them to be in a space where they're doing something that the rest of us don't understand. And sometimes we need to ask for silence around the bed and sometimes we just need to ask people to step outside for a while. So while people are still able to talk to us, I think it's really important that we check, do they, do they want some quiet, do they want some peace? Uh, one of the things that all of us who work regularly with people who are dying are aware of is that there's a number of people who having been accompanied constantly, but minute by minute for days, will somehow conspire to take their last breath when there's nobody in the room because somebody's popped out of the loo or whatever. And it seems to happen more often than is likely simply by chance. So what is that about? And is it about the need for quiet and peace to actually just relax into doing the dying? So it's checking all of the time, isn't it? And what we encourage families to chat around the bed, let, let the dying person hear the voices of people who they love. But perhaps we ought to be alternating that with periods where we just say, I'm just going to, I'm going to pop outside Mom, for the next 10 minutes. I'm just going to be outside. I'm very close. I love you very much. I'll still be here, but you'll just be on your own in the room for a moment. Maybe we need to give people that chance. A bit of space. Yeah, give them a bit of space. space. As, as, you, as you would in life. And yeah, I mean, in the two experiences I have, um, only two, uh, the person has been exactly themselves right until the very end. So don't expect a sudden different personality to emerge necessarily simply because somebody is, is dying. Uh, do, do any of the other speakers want to comment on, on those questions as they came or? Can I? Uh, and Leah. Um, I, th I think that it's uh, very interesting questions because don't forget that if somebody's at home, then the relatives are there 24 seven. And actually the continuity is with them. And professionals, whoever they are, however brilliant they are, still are only dipping in and out and are dipping in and out of their lives. And I think that we really must respect the space and the role of people who are the people who've lived with this person, who know this person inside out. They know all of the difficulties they've had with them as well as all the good times. And they have so much churning around in them. And so in that question about continuity of care, then the relatives are the continuity of care and the professionals are a bit like the icing on the cake. But actually you don't want only icing with no cake. That's a very good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I go to the live questions, uh, the, the questions which have come in since we started and begin, if I can, with you, Baroness Finley, because there's a question here about what you the very striking stuff you said about DNR, DNA, DNA, CPR. Um, do you, it says uh, it's from Nigel Parker, I should say, do you recommend any other arrangement when a very elderly person goes into hospital, if not DNA? Well, please don't write down DNAR because it doesn't say what you DNA, mean. DNA, CPR, yeah. So please let's have, uh, let's have a care plan. Let's decide what will be done and then what won't be done. But remember that even if you've got a care plan written out with someone's wishes, that is an advanced statement of wishes that's allowed for in the Mental Capacity Act. You must still check out that that's still their wish. So somebody may say, I didn't want to have a drip up under any circumstances. But then for some reason, they're dry, whatever, and you think symptomatically it really might help. Then you can, you can say, that, would you like to, because it might help you, but if you don't want to, we'll give you other care. And I've had several instances, many during my professional life, where dying patients have said, I don't want this, I don't want that. And then when it comes to the bit, they've said, actually, I want it this time. I just don't want it next time. Um, and that's been particularly over antibiotics to treat an infection. And I have one lady who on three occasions said, 
actually, I want antibiotics for my chest infection this time. It's next time I won't want it. <laughs> and then when next time comes, who knows? Next time came, she wanted them yes. again. And actually, yes. she was on antibiotics when she died. But, mm. you know, you have to renegotiate. You must never assume that something somebody said weeks ago, something that they thought theoretically might happen, when it comes to it, they may well feel differently. And similarly, we see people who say, oh, I don't want to carry on living. I, I, I want out of it. I've had enough. And then that desire to die changes into a really strong desire to live. And they almost flip-flop between a will to live and, and, a, and a will to die. And it's almost as if they're expressing acceptance of dying when they talk about, I'll just get it over with. I just want it over with versus actually that strong will to live and other things they might want to do in life. And perhaps they need empowering to finish those life tasks. Really, really good points. Kathy Pennicott has sent a question in um, and perhaps uh, Ghazala might like to take this up. Um, I have recently completed a sole midwife course to be an end of life companion, but it appears that there is nobody allowing volunteers into hospitals or care homes or hospices near where I live. Are any of the panel aware of places I can begin to offer help or get help about that? Catherine, you, you, Catherine Mannix, you nodded enthusiastically there. Oh, I, is I, Gazala, no, go on, Catherine, you, you go on and then I'll go. No, well, I'm going to defer mainly to Gazala, who, who is an end of life doula. I'm, I'm um, patron of End of Life Doula UK, which is uh, Gazala's uh, organization um, but I know that we've got soul midwives on this call, call we've got people from butterfly volunteers on this call there are lots of different organizations offering uh, end-of-life accompaniment while hospitals are being very very cagey about any additional visitors as part of their control of infection um, that Elora spoke about so beautifully People still are dying at home. People still are frightened at home. People still want to do their advanced care planning, even though they're not on their deathbeds yet at home. I think anybody who has the training to offer that kind of compassionate listening and generate the space for people to start to have those conversations would be very, very welcome. And we need to find ways of making people more aware that there are these trained volunteers available. And somebody in the questions has asked about wanting non-religious volunteers well because I spoke beautifully about how whatever organization people belong to they are not there to voice their own individual beliefs on the dying person we're there to accompany the person in the way that they feel comfortable and want to be supported and, and that's actually a, a really, really important part of practice. But I want to let Gazala say something about end of life doulas and the, and the training and, and trying to make the space out in the community. Mm. Gazala, please feel free. Sure. Um, I think um, we've seen the initial knee jerk reaction of everything shutting down the hospitals, the hospices, and everything. People aren't being allowed, the families or even the end of life doulas. So, similarly, all our services have been you go home. They've started letting people back in through telephone calls. Um, but as Catherine said, there's a lot of um, people who are at home. They need support. As end of life doulas, we've run a 24 hours helpline initially. So uh, people are calling the helpline to say, please help me. It's about my mother who's there and I'm in US or I'm so far away here. Can you please help? Those calls have been coming. End of life doulas have started now going into not only just people's home, but also in nursing homes, because those people who are at home cannot be just managed towards the end. So they are going into the nursing homes and that's where doulas are. So I'd like to say, please get in touch uh, with the end of life doulas. There are, there, there is a need. And I think we need to go back or getting back into institutions like hospice, like um, hospitals, to say, well, there are ways we can wear protective, protective PPEs and go in. We will provide the continuity, which is what they want, because they're not seeing anyone and then having the professionals there for a sh very short time doesn't help. I wanted to pick well, up one- No, on. do go on, apologies, do go on. That's right, I, was, I just wanted to pick up something else earlier on, which Baroness Ilona Finley said, is I have seen in my experience people wishes change. Um, I do, 
I do their advanced statement and decisions, but as time unfolds, it's so important to keep asking, but it's so important to do those things. The more we talk about, the more they talk about, at least they know the options rather than last minute. I've been to people's home where they've not talked about whether they wanted to be cremated or uh, buried. And when they talk about it, their partners are in shock to say, oh, I didn't know this is what they wanted. And I would have buried you, you wanted cremation. So all these important conversations are so important to have. Thank you very much. Um, question here from Susan at Malander. She says, my sister is an intensive care uh, nurse hang on it's disappeared there it is is an intensive uh, care unit nurse she's not trained in being that person at the end of life usually there is family there recently she had a husband on the phone as his wife died it's covid obviously i imagine how can we help those critical care people to deal with this added stress when it isn't their role um again uh, perhaps baroness finley um uh, perhaps uh, dr lynn bassett also might like to say something on that baroness finley yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's always difficult. And I don't think you can be trained particularly to deal with unusual difficult situations. You do your best. You cannot make bad good. And if you're sincere, then the other person on the end of the phone will know that. And I actually think that the most important thing is that people are authentic and that they let themselves feel and recognize what they're doing. And there's no shame in it. I've always said in, in, in the inpatient units, when you go and cry in the broom cupboard, somebody's been there and cried before you. Um, you know, I've sat and cried with relatives, uh, even having been doing palliative medicine for years. Sometimes I've looked after friends. It's been desperately sad. You can't be trained. If you think you can be trained to be tough, then you probably shouldn't even start the training. Actually, just be authentic is what I would say. And if, if the nurse has been upset, then fantastic of her because she showed she cared. I did a study years ago amongst bereaved parents when they'd been told their child was dead. And the thing that screamed out from it was the policeman had tears in his eyes. The doctor showed she cared. The nurse was upset. I will always remember that. That's what they remember, that somebody felt and shared. Dr. Lynn Bassett, you're nodding. Along yeah, there. I'd I'd echo that absolutely. It's the humanity that counts, and the humanity is often painful. And and to be fair, you know, if you're a busy nurse on a ward, you don't always have time to 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 manage that. Along with all the other things that you're worrying that you ought to do, it's it it plays into my argument for more feet on the ground. You know, I think these liaison people that 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 they began to um, assign. To, to people who called in, I just think was so useful. And I think we need more of that. Um, and, and I don't see why end of life companions couldn't step into that role. Um, it, it, it's, it's just about sharing the load really, isn't it? But uh, it, yeah, being human, there's no, there's no, no crime to being human at all. Um, it, it's, it's the most important. The gentleman next door who died this morning, um, was was very moved by the nurse who came and looked at his paintings and was and she herself was moved by his paintings. The fact that she had a conversation with him about his work and his life gave him more healing in his last hours than probably she'd injected him with something or other. So you know that well, because, humanity really because she recognised she she related to him as the man he was and still is at that point rather than yeah. patient. Mm. Yeah, yeah, makes a really good point. And um, Darren Evans, this is a question for all the panelists, so you can fight over it. <laughs> Given the time we find ourselves in, does the panel think the time is right for the introduction of technology to enable a more compassionate, joined up, holistic approach to end of life care? Dr. Catherine Mannix is waving at me, go on. <laughs> Oh dear Lord, and Laura <laughs> is waving at you as well. We are trying, 
so hard <laughs> to have joined up tech systems between the NHS, social care, hospices in the independent sector. It isn't for the want of trying. It is for the want of joined upness across the whole piece. And it requires government will to make it happen. Technology yes. is a tool. It does not have a soul. People have a soul. So a piece of paper is just as good as any technology. Write it down, leave it there. That's a means of communication. But it isn't the paper that has the feelings. It isn't the paper that subtly moves and responds to somebody and shows that they are listening. And listening means that you listen, not with your ears just, but you listen from the heart with your undivided attention. There's no technology can do that. And yet that is what makes us human. And, and a follow up to that, Ghazala, I wonder what you think, or first things, have you used, um, have you communicated to anybody uh, via iPad or iPhone as, as end of life support? Um, or is yours all person to person in, in your presence? Um, it has been in the past person to person, but lately it has been via phone because either the person doesn't know how to use the video calling because they're so old and they're so isolated. But I was saying that uh, I do feel, although technology now has a place, but ideally for all the people who are coming to towards the end of life and having a life limiting diagnosis, ideally it will be so nice for them to be assigned a companion very earlier on so they can walk walk alongside with them and whether it's to do with using technology or not and finding out ways but we ideally that would be a that should be the play, that should be the starting point that we have someone walking along with us and anyone else like to add to that I, I suppose just the blended blended approach my friend who was dying of parkinson's and couldn't had no movement in his hands um, had the most enormous joy um, uh, dialing people up on his mobile phone. He couldn't speak either. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody, me, the companion, had to dial the numbers. He then had the joy of listening to the other person on the end. So I think, you know, it, it, technology is good, but but humans are often needed too. Mm. Um. Christina Mottram says, it strikes me that as we've got to know more about pregnancy and birth than previous generations, we've not allowed the same language about death. Um, I, I think that's a really important point to make, isn't it? I think, um, Catherine Mannix, a, a lot of what you were describing there uh, and, and Baroness Laura Finley, when, when you were saying, you know, somebody says, no, I don't want this, uh, you know, two weeks ago, and then come the moment they want something else. I mean, that happens in labour as well a lot, doesn't it? When a woman is in labour, she comes into the hospital with a big plan. And then once things kick in, it's like, oh, I have a different plan. You know, I mean, it, it's it's being alive to the plan, isn't it? To the person's it, changing plan. It, it absolutely is. And also, of course, midwives help us all the way through pregnancy with the preparation, with the planning. We make the plan. They're really kind. They don't laugh at the plan. They know all the different ways that it might not go that way, but they take it very seriously. They encourage us to think about who will be our companions, where the birth will take place. It's so analogous. And then on delivery day, they are there, they are narrating the labour. They are saying, remember this thing that we talked about, that bearing down feeling, that pressure, that pain, that breathing we practice doing this is what's happening now and the next thing that we expect to happen will be and we can midwife dying in the same way we can walk alongside people and help them to plan and prepare and we can walk with them when they are in the process of dying saying to them and saying to their dearest people so what do you see here now what do you hear now what do you think is going on for her how do you think she is and then when people hear the, the strange breathing that they've never heard before and say she's yeah. drowning, we can say, well, no, let's just listen again and let's just look together at this. And so we decatastrophize that really unfamiliar thing and help people to see what's really happening so that in their bereavement, they haven't 
misunderstood and thought that the involuntary noises were groaning or that the bubbling was drowning. And so they don't take some kind of awful traumatic interpretation into their bereavement with them. Midwifing the deathbed is something we absolutely have to begin to do. Mm. And um, Baroness Laura Finley, you, you you touched on uh, dementia and you know, managing communication with someone who has dementia um, near the end of their life. Liam Canfield sends a message uh, in relation to raising conversations surrounding death and preferences for end of life. Does the panel have any experiences or suggestions how to promote these conversations for individuals with a learning disability? Maybe you'd like to start. Laura. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some really fantastic resources and things like books beyond words, um, which can help discuss things. Uh, they are a nice, easy way with pictures to start a conversation. But then also, uh, it is about just talking in the simple terms that the person with learning difficulties can understand the type of language that they use are things they're familiar with. Um, and perhaps they've seen a dead animal and they can be reminded of that. Um, and that the dead animal was quite peaceful. It was just lying there. Um, nothing frightening, nothing scary. Uh, but they also need to understand uh, the impact when it's their relative that's dying too. And they need support to be there and have, have things explained. Um, and I do worry that in, during COVID, there's been uh, a pulling away uh, from the bedside, perhaps of a child with learning difficulties if the parent is dying. Um, and sometimes, sometimes a parent is dying so rapidly no, uh, the deaths from COVID have been very rapid, but deaths from anything, death from a road accident, death from coming off a bike, uh, all happens very rapidly. So it, it is about talking to them in the language that you normally use with them and that they understand in the terms that they understand. And drawings and playing play demonstration can be helpful too. And just we're, we're reaching the end of our time um, on the webinar, but um, uh, Gazala, can I ask you whether you think classing soul midwives and end of life doulas as key workers could be something that comes out of this phase or enacted during this phase, COVID? I think um, it's so important that we do have companions, the end of life companions, and they are companions, not professionals, because, and we come, we've talked about these, people have touched. We come from a place uh, of really love, kindness, compassion. These are human qualities. Everyone's got it. I wear many hats. I wear a professional hat as well as a doula hat. And when I'm going into doing my doula, I really take a toolkit with me, which has all this. When I go into someone's house as a professional, I really take another toolkit. And I'm going there to do a job, to finish that, to advise them to move away. Doulas don't do that. They have endless amount of time. We, and you need that because you can't go to someone and say, right, I'm off. I gave you some examples. I couldn't have told that lady who was holding my hand towards her end to say, right, I've got something else to do. I'm only here for 10 minutes. So um, soul midwives, doulas, going forwards, I can't see any other ways. And there are two reasons, not just because family are not around, but even with family around, they need support. They don't know how to access things. They don't, and emotionally we are not connected to, to the people we serve. So they can tell us so many things, but they can't tell the family. I've had this time and time again, and we know life is complicated. Families are complicated. Two sides of family don't talk. The mother wants to see um, the rest of the family. Doulas navigate that way so that the mother can actually see everyone rather than um, just the family who's caring for it. So doulas navigate so many things and like similarly soul, soul midwives and other end of life. So there is so much need for it on a citizenship level. So, you know, but making sure that they're recognized and we open up our doors everywhere, hospital, hospices, at home, because everyone 
can decide where they want to be. And at the end of the day, if I'm dying, all I want to see is another kind person there. Doesn't matter where I die, to me. Everyone will have their own. But it's having this kind people, and we can have that by not having just a professional for five minutes. And I think uh, what you say there about your role within the wider context of the family as well, is that you're like a, a softening agent for the whole situation because fear, well, you know, we all know fear can make people tense and it can make people unreceptive to the truth. It can make people unreceptive to one another. And it, it, I think to have a, to have a gazala in the room would be, a, would be a, a, an addition to any situation. Thank you. Listen, before I say thank you to all of you, um, uh, the panelists, and I hope to those of you who've got questions, sent questions in, but didn't have them explicitly asked that you had them answered in, in our themed conversation. Um, some headlines, I suppose, uh, to take away from it. Um, be authentic and human. Uh, make room to let relatives stay if they would like to stay with their loved one during COVID-19. And that's, a, that's been a huge issue, I have to say, coming through on my radio program. Real desperation and distress um, when people are kept away from their relatives. A uh, clear need uh, for end of life companions. I think Gazala said it more eloquently than anyone could. Uh, no one should die alone. Technology is a tool. It does not have a soul, Baroness Laura Finlay, good quote. Uh, and listening with the heart, with your undivided attention. So on that, uh, I will thank uh, Dr. Lynn Bassett, Dr. Catherine Mannix, um, Baroness Laura Finlay uh, and Ghazala Makda, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to the Art of Dying Well at St. Mary's University in Twickenham. Many thanks. <laughs>